when a leader on the battlefield leads, they're in the front because they're showing their team that they have so much trust in them that they will catch the bullets first for them. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Underground Kings podcast. Today, I am joined once again by Mr. Tom Winslow. Tom, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me once again. I didn't bore you enough the last time. We'll try this time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's, do, let's, let's run through a brief, brief overview. So sure. you are founder of a law firm. I um, am. I'm sure that's action-packed. Yeah, you know, it's funny. One is I never planned to be the founder of a law firm. Like, I never planned to own a business. Um, when I was uh, preparing my life, the ownership of a business was not in the cards. I actually had planned on just being an employee my entire life. No, I, don't, I can't think of a single person in my family that owns a business, uh, in my immediate family. So it wasn't ever something I was exposed to, uh, to be an entrepreneur. And it just kind of happened. You know, you just kind of roll with life. You adapt to situations and uh, fell into a situation where I had to do it. And that's where we are now. <laughs> so give a... I won't have you run through the whole story because if anyone wants to watch the full story, I'll go ahead and plug in episode one with Tom at the end of this video. But well, if, um, you, if you need some sleep, episode one, and if you <laughs> need some more sleep, episode two. That's right. Well, we hopefully we'll keep him a little <laughs> more alive. We'll keep him alive. This time. <laughs> um, but maybe just a brief overview of how yeah. it is that you landed in your situation because I have a feeling a lot of the understanding of where you stand on certain things and your perspective on certain scenarios definitely plays off of the journey that led you into where you are now. Yeah, you know, um, you know, many times you can ask the question of, you know, how did you get to where you are? And the question always is, where'd you come from, right? And so I grew up in a situation where my dad worked for someone his entire life. My mom worked for someone her entire life. And I saw that as an example. And so I knew I wanted to become an attorney. And I just planned on working for someone, working with somebody my entire life. Never thought I'd have that own firm. And so, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago now, I'm old, uh, gray hair, <laughs> unlike you, no hair, unlike you. <laughs> um, I uh, went to law school, graduated law school, had a job doing defense work, had a job doing plaintiff work, and honestly got married to my wife. And I was preparing, we were preparing to go to our Christmas party. Uh, and two days before the Christmas party, we were Checking, I was checking the phone to look for directions to go to the party. I thought we were like going to the party, look for directions to go to the party. I had a voicemail, I answered the voicemail um, like December 23rd. And it was my then boss telling me that I was fired and not to bother coming to the Christmas party. And that was two days before Christmas. My wife was four months pregnant. Um, we had you know, kind of just started out buying a house and all that kind of stuff. Kind of situation a lot of people find themselves in, right? You, know, you look at the situation and you go, holy cow, what am I going to do? And I've always made it. A, a situation where I can't always control the action, but I can control the reaction, right? And so instead of falling down into a stupor of, I'm not going to be able to feed my kid, right? I'm not going to be able to afford my mortgage, I'm not going to be able to handle the situation, um, we turned around and seven days later started up the then firm that we were with, uh, Goldfinch Winslow, before this firm, right? And so that was 2012, I believe. And then 2013, January 1st, 2013, so December 23rd, 2012, two days before Christmas, I was terminated. January 1st, 2013, we started Goldfinch Winslow with two attorneys and a paralegal in 70 cases. And now, you know, was this 12 years later? We now have Winslow Law Firm with seven attorneys, three locations, over 3,000 cases came in last year. Um, just simply because we made the decision not to despair due to what I could not control, but to control how I reacted to it. And that's kind of what I believe an entrepreneur does. You know, so many times in our life, and I know you're the same way, we have a plan, we, we have a destination we want to go to, but things don't go according to plan. And I don't know how many times it's ever gone according to plan in your mind, ever, <laughs> Right, you want to date that girl, it doesn't work out that way. You want to have that job, it doesn't work out that way. You want to get that grade, it doesn't work out that way. You can choose to be upset about it, or you can choose to adapt to the situation, and make the best out of it. And so, as an attorney and as a firm and as a business owner, that's what we decide to do: is to focus on the solution and not focus on the problem. And I really believe that's what's made us as successful as I think we are. You know, I think we're successful compared to other standards. We might not be, <laughs> but I think we are compared to where I was. 
13 years ago. Now, a lot of people would look at that, look at the decision that you made to move on so quickly and, and take on such a, such a large endeavor, you know, and, and in such short time, someone could maybe say you just did it on gut inc- instinct. Um, but like, what kind of, what is your thought process in moments like that? Because not everyone can make decisions like that that quickly. Not everyone can merely go off their gut instinct. They get caught up overthinking these things or they think about everything that could go wrong. And it seems to me like you just focus on, well, all these things could go wrong, but this could go right and you focus on that. The worst decision you can make is no decision. When you get paralyzed in fear or you get paralyzed in a situation where you can't make a reaction to it, nothing will ever change. No matter what direction you pick, as long as you're moving forward, it's the right decision. And you might say, that, that's not always right. right? Do, I date, do I date guy A? Do I date guy B? Or do I just sit here and do nothing? If you always just sit there and do nothing, you will always for the rest of your life do nothing. At least if you move in one direction, you can move in a different direction later. Right? I make mistakes all the time. Right? That's my wife. Shoot, that's my team. <laughs> but we're moving in a direction. And if that's the wrong direction, then we know that and we can move in a different direction. But if I never move, I never know what the right direction is. And so when you're faced with a situation where, you know, do I go with a piece of equipment, you know, car A or car B, just pick one. You can always change later. But if you don't pick one, you'll never have a car. <laughs> right? So just keep moving. Just keep going forward. And so that was the decision we made you know, on December 23rd. You know, I didn't even wait until Christmas Day before I started making calls. Of what am I going to do? Right? Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, the day after Christmas, Right, I'm calling people I know, including my former partner, saying, "Hey, you know, we talked about having a firm right over Christmas. Right, it's not the most proper time to call people and say, hey, you want to change your life, also, <laughs> right? And, and, and but it's the decision just to take action. Because the last thing you can possibly do is not take any action at all. That's the worst thing you can do. It's just paralysis. And that's what happens so many times. They call it anxiety, right? They call it a panic attack. They call it whatever they want to call it. What it is is paralysis." You're too afraid to take an action that you get stuck without an action. And then if you're stuck without an action, you are going nowhere. And all we ever want to do in life and in business and as attorneys or for our clients is move, help them move forward, is move forward a little bit. And sometimes that's a half step forward. And sometimes that's massive leaps forward. But it always just starts with a decision being made, not no decision ever at all. Now, I know both from your story as well as the way you act on a day-to-day uh, as well as some potentially some may call it reckless activities that you like to partake in. I love reckless activities. <laughs> you, you have a, a, a blatant draw towards risk. I love it. And, and my question to you is, do you feel that your gravitation towards higher risk scenarios is something that you acquired in life through your experiences or do you feel that you are just the type of person like it takes a certain type of person to be born that way like it's in your dna so one of the things that you may be referencing is my love of skydiving Mm -hmm. right um i love skydiving Uh, i'm in the state guard Uh, i'm a certified paratrooper with the state guard i love jumping out of airplanes Corden, do you know what my biggest fear in life is heights i hate heights really I, i hate them like, like, don't put me on a ladder. Don't make, me, don't make me climb up there and get on a roof and look down. I hate it. But when you ask the question is, are you born into it? Or is it something that I accepted? It's something that I choose to overcome. I will not let an obstacle stop me from an activity or a purpose or a dream or a goal. Right? The thing I'm looking at next year, or actually this year now uh, that we're in it, is there's an opportunity in Marble Beach to rappel down a 17-story building, right? So you go to the top of a 17-story building, and you get to rappel down the side of this building. And that's kind of the thing I'm looking at to this year. That's kind of the fun thing. You know, last year, did the skydiving, made the knife, did the race car driving, probably some other things I can't remember, made the jewelry, right? all these different opportunities. Um, because I'm not going to let a fear stop me from life. Right? I'm not going to allow paralysis to stop me. So it's a mental decision I've made. I was not, I was not born a risk taker. 
Right? I didn't want to start a business because I wanted the surety of a paycheck. Right? That's something I that's being an employee is the surety of a paycheck, the benefits, the security blanket that you're taking care of. And because when you're an employee, you don't have to take the risk. You just have, you just have to show up. Right. And if you do the work, you get a check. Right. I can show up 20 hours a day, and I have shown up 20 hours a day and not received a check. All right. I've had to write the checks. <laughs> I received the check. So I've made the mental decision that no matter what obstacle comes in my way, I will overcome that. Now, will I overcome it by simply jumping off the cliff? Will I overcome that by stepping around it? Will I overcome that by driving right through it? That's depending on the situation and logical decision-making on how best to handle that situation. But that obstacle will only be considered a speed bump and not a wall. I will get past it in one way or another. Mm-hmm. So at what point, can you pinpoint a point in your life when you had this paradigm shift? Um, probably when I had to make a decision of what to do for my wife and my child, right? All of us have a situation called where we have to take care of ourselves at some point. And then we have a situation, right? And a lot of times that might be you know, middle school, high school, college, maybe you know, single life after college. And then it becomes the situation that you have to decide that it's no longer about taking care of yourself and it's about taking care of somebody else. Right. And that was, of course, when I had my wife, when you have your spouse, when you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you have to put them first. Right. For a relationship to work. Right? Same thing with clients. Right. If I, as an attorney, I have a client, I have to put my client first above myself for the relationship to work. Right. Whatever relationship you have, if you're always putting yourself first, then you will never have a tr- meaningful relationship that builds trust amongst each other. Once I had my wife, I had to put her first. And then once I had Leah, my nine-year-old girl, I had to put her first. And then once I had William, I had to put him first. Nowhere in there was I ever first ever again when that decision got made. And so when I had become faced with that obstacle of losing my job, I had to decide, was it me who got to wallow in my pity for being fired? My wife didn't get me fired. My unborn daughter didn't get me fired. I was terminated because... My boss and I didn't see eye to eye on how he was running his firm. And I didn't understand that as an employee, that as an employer, that was his firm. He could run how he wanted to run it. And if I didn't like it, I didn't have to be there. And I could choose not to be there or he could choose for me not to be there. <laughs> he chose for me not to be there, right? So when that happened, I had to say, do I, do, you know, it's Christmas, it's unfair, this is unfair, you did this to me and my family. Why is this not fair? I could say, okay, I'm going to control my reaction because I can't control your action. And this is what I'm going to do about it. And that's when the paradigm shifted. Because then when I decided to start the business, it was my business. And then I didn't come first. The business came first. And when I had employees, I didn't come first. The business didn't come first. The employees came first. And when I had employees and clients, then the clients and the employees came first. So now, once that happened, now I've got a business, clients, employees, community, wife, children that all come before me. I will never, ever again become first. And when I realized that, then I realized I could not let my fears get in the way of the people I love and the people I'm serving and taking care of those people. I could not let me or my own personal hangups and fears overcome what's best for them. Right? And so for my wife and my children and my clients, whether I want to make that phone call or not, whether I want to work at midnight or not, whether I want to be ready for that deposition or trial or not, whether I want to go jumping off a cliff... <laughs> or going to the office doesn't matter. What matters is what's best for those that I serve because I made that decision because I can't serve myself anymore. Now, when it comes to the amount of hours, the sheer number of hours that you work and the tenacity at which you put forth effort, at how are you able to, or what is your perspective on how you go about putting that family, your wife, your children first as a priority. How is it that you are still able to pursue that mission for them while also giving your wife and your children probably the most valuable asset that you have to give, and that's your time? Um, My wife is a time love language, right? And I'm huge... Uh, on the word perspective, and Colton knows that, right? Perspective for me is my favorite word in the world. And when you learn perspective, your world changes. 
right? Because everyone has a perspective, and it's their own. Everyone has their own perspective. In the world we live in, so many people want to put their perspective first. Not only do they want to put their perspective first, they want to put their perspective only. Why can't you see things the way I see them? Why can't you see it as a Republican? Why can't you see it as a Democrat? Why can't you see it as a Christian or a Muslim? Why can't you see it as a man or a woman? Right? That's my perspective. So when you stop thinking from your perspective and you actually start considering the other perspective, it will change who you are. Right? Same concept as I talked about before. If I look at things and I say, Lauren, I have to work, my wife, right? Leah, I can't come to your dance recital. William, I, got, I have to go to that deposition or that trial. I can't be there for you. So from my perspective, that work has to be done. But from my child's perspective, from my wife's perspective, they did not marry my work. They married me. They are stuck to me. And my children didn't have a choice. They're stuck with me whether they like it or not. More at least had a choice, right? So when I look at it from my wife's perspective or my children's perspective or my client's perspective or your perspective, if I say I'm going to do something and I don't show up to be here today, from your perspective, how does that make you feel? From my wife's perspective, how does that make her feel? From my children's perspective, how does that really make them feel? Right? From my client's perspective, who at times are putting their entire life in my hands. Like literally, they could be putting their life in their hands with criminal situations. They could be putting their house in my hands. They can be putting millions of dollars in my hands and trusting me with that. My employees that I work with, the team that I love that I work with, not only are they putting their time and their efforts in my hands, but they're putting their family in my hands. Because that paycheck that they get helps pay for their family, helps pay for their children's food. So is it fair from their perspective that I don't do what I say I'm going to do, that I won't be where I say I'm going to be, that I don't live up to my responsibilities because I didn't want to wake up that morning, because I didn't want to come to work that day, because I want to take the weekend off. So from my perspective, yeah, that sounds nice to have some sleep. But from the people that I serve and from their perspective, is that fair to them that I'm doing that? Right? Society and so many professionals, including attorneys, believe that they're important. Look at social media. Look at my selfies. I'm important. You see videos of people by themselves dancing, you know, doing hair, makeup, doing their, doing their thing. How many of them actually say, it's not about me, it's actually about you? And what if each one of us said, it's not about me? I'm not going to give myself 100%. I'm going to give you 100%. What if every single person said, I'm going to give you 100%? And everywhere you went, the person next to you was looking out for your interest because you were looking out for their interest. Where would we be if that was the situation? And so I have chosen simply to look out for other people's perspective and to recognize that other people might not see things the same way I do. And it doesn't mean they're wrong about it. It just means they have different education, different background, different circumstances, different situations that are going on that I just can't understand, but I can understand them. And I can accept them for who they are. Do you feel, do you ever kind of have a moment in time where you yourself, your perspective shifts on the note of where you should be allocating your time? Like, All are, the time. are there ever, I'm sure there's a lot All of, time. I constantly deal with that. Well, I, I, I go to the office sometimes at night. Last night, I was working, I was working on some legal work, depositions, getting ready. Midnight, 1 a.m. I was there. Texting my wife saying, I love you. I just need you to know I love you. Because I'm sitting there at the office crying at my desk because I can't spend that night with her. Right? Because I know where I want to be. <laughs> like, I don't want to be at the office at 1 a.m. And having to be back at the office, being at, at a meeting at 7 a.m., having to be back at the office at 10 a.m. <laughs> right? That's not what my perspective, that's not what I want. Right? but I know that's what I have to do to serve those that I serve. Right? So does my perspective ever change? It always does. And there's times I literally have to fight against what I personally want to do. And it's times that it rips me apart. Like I'm literally at my desk crying because I want to be at home with my wife and my children. Right? But, I, but I've been with them until 8 or 9 o'clock at night, right? Because I was working. I went home 5 or 6. I had dinner with them. I played with them. I tucked them into bed. I kissed my wife goodnight. And I said, I love you. And then I went back to the office because I knew they were going to bed. And I knew I had to, t now I had to go serve my clients and be ready for the next day because it's not fair to them not to. Do I want to leave my house at 9 o'clock at night and serve my second shift 
back at the office? No. No one wants to do that. That's not something you want to do. No one says, yay, sign me up for 20 hours a day. It's a choice you have to make. And it's a choice you make when you run a business. When you accept that responsibility of clients and a, and a wife and kids, you can't say, I'm going to have wife and kids and never be there. Hey, I'm going to have a business and never be there. Hey, I'm going to have clients and never serve them. You can't do it. What were your parents like? Um, my dad was gone six months out of the year. Uh, he was uh, a computer guy, an IT guy. But he served, worked with the government. Uh, he went to all the military bases and airports, helping them install their uh, computer equipment, doing their technology stuff, which is why I'm so terrible with technology, I'm sure, because I, I hate that stuff. <laughs> um, he's gone six months out of the year, uh, you know, gone weeks at a time. So my mom raised us a lot. Um, but she was working during the day, too, because he wasn't around. Uh, but my dad was always there. He was a disciplinarian. He held the fort down. Uh, my mom was kind of a disciplinarian, too. But she was the fun one, you know, we always hung out with. It was me and my sister. She's about 18 months younger than me. Um, and she and I would fight all the time. And we get along great now, but we fight all the time. Uh, but my parents were hard workers. That's what they did. They were employees, and they worked hard. They didn't complain. I remember, I remember actually... Uh, one time, uh, probably maybe the only one time I saw my dad and my mom really physically upset, other than when my mom's father passed away. But um, they were in the back room, uh, kind of huddled together. My dad had been suspended from work because they had thought he had overbilled them and overpaid them or overcharged them for hours because um, he had worked so many hours. They didn't believe he could work that many hours. And so they literally suspended him to do an investigation to see if he actually worked the hours he put down, which he did. But he was suspended for like two or three weeks, and they thought he might lose his job because he actually worked so much. They couldn't believe he worked as much as he did. Um, and, and that was, but it didn't change. He was still going to be an employee, right? He was still employed. He was going to be an employee, and that's what he did. Um, my dad grew up on a farm in North Carolina. My mom grew up in the city of New York, right? It's a completely different size of the coin, man. But, uh, that's what they were. They, they head down, work, make a comfortable living, and provide for their children. And do you feel like, in the, in the sense of your father being gone six months at a time, you said, do you feel that that was instilled in you from a young age in your father, you know, obviously as a kid, you, you didn't want your father to go away for six months at a time. But as you grow older and you start to understand, it's the why. It's the why he went away for six months to provide for his family the way that a man should, mm -hmm. to make sure that there's a roof over the head, there's food on the table, bills are paid, mm -hmm. and that the kids can live a happy and enjoy enjoyable life. Mm -hmm. And now there is a lot of power in that. And I think a lot of what our society, a lot of issues in society today are you know, family structures lacking those traditional values. I agree. In that, you know, the there's there's a lot of there's a lot of blurred lines now. And, you know, I was raised the same way. You know, your father was out and he was working, he was doing these things, but there was as you grow, especially I believe as a young boy into a young man and then adulthood, you come to understand that you, you come to understand the reason, the reasoning why the absence was there. Mm -hmm. As a child, like I said, it, it makes no sense and it, it hurts at times. But then you, you come to realize and you come to see the same values in yourself. Mm -hmm. So there's so much to be, in the, in the short term, there's so much for a child to gain from their father's presence all the time. But in the long term, there's so much to be gained in a father's absence. 100%. You know, the, the biggest problem I have is as a child, you can't understand the perspective of, of an adult, right? Like I couldn't, as a seven-year-old boy, understand why my dad wasn't there. Shoot, as an 18-year-old boy, I probably couldn't understand why my dad wasn't there, right? It's not until you fall into that same situation Honestly, when you have a, a spouse or you have kids or you have a job, I can't understand what an employer is going through until I'm an employer, right? And you can't become 
someone that understands what a father is going through until you become a father. Right? It's interesting. You know, so during the holiday season, it's a joyous time of year for a lot of people, right? Um, employees get time off. They get to go on vacation. Maybe they have vacation dates they have to use up. Maybe they um, uh, get Christmas bonuses, right? Christmas gifts, Christmas parties. From the employee's perspective, man, what a great two weeks. You know, the, last, the end of December is employer. I'm paying out bonuses. I'm not getting a bonus. <laughs> I'm hosting parties that I'm paying for, right? Uh, no one in my world, no one wants to sue or get a divorce during Christmas time. So I'm not making any money. Money's not coming in. Courts aren't open during that time period. So no money's coming in. My employees are getting three, four, five days off. I'm having to pay them their stuff. No money's coming in. So from an employer perspective, this holiday season is awesome. I love it, but it costs a lot of money because you're not making money. You're spending a lot of money, especially when you got like 20 employees, right? So I'm paying out 20, 20 employees for five days off in a two-week period where no money's coming in at all. So I'm paying 100 days worth of salaries when not one dime's coming into the firm. 100 days worth of salaries is three months worth of salaries that I'm paying out over a two-week period for no work being done. Plus, I, plus, I'm giving them bonuses and gifts and parties. It's an expensive time of year when nothing comes in. Plus, at the end of the year, which you know means tax implications, right? So it's all perspective, right? You can't be a, you can't understand what a father goes through until you're a father. You can't understand what a mother's going through until you're a mother. You can't understand what your employer's going through until you're an employer. You can try. You can try to put yourself in your, their shoes, but you're not having to pay the bills or pay the time, right? My father had to had to put us first. I didn't know that then, right? And my kids probably don't know that now. I had to put us first so that way we had food in a house, which was what we needed, and we didn't know that. Because it, what good does it do for me to be with my dad and my mom sleeping in their car trying to eat every day when he can work his butt off and give us a house and food and give us a security of where to be, even if he can't be there all the time? It's a trade-off. You can't have it all. You just can't. That's what life is. And do you feel that there is a ceiling to that or um, a potential limit for that? Because one could argue that beyond a certain point of income, you are now trading your time or, or et cetera for things that are beyond the means of your family. Because, you know, if let's say you had accumulated enough wealth at this point in your life to ensure that there was going to be a roof over your wife and children's heads, food was going to be on the table for the rest of their lifetimes. Do you then look at it as, well, now I'm working for the next generations? You could, or you can look at what your role is and how you define your role, right? Am I um, a father? Am I a husband? Am I a boss? Am I a manager? Do I manage the family? Do I manage the business? Am I an owner? Or am I a leader? Right? Um, I want to believe I am not a father or a husband or a boss or an owner. I want to believe I'm a leader. And I, and I lead my children through example. I lead my children on where is best for them and their opportunities to make free will decisions through my guidance. I want to believe I lead my wife to a place of security and confidence and trust, but not of control, right? I want to believe I lead my team and my clients to a place where they can be successful, where they can share in the bounty of wealth or in the community's, you know, respect that hopefully we have as a firm and I've generated, right? So, so what is your purpose? What is your why? Are you doing it for the money? I've never once done it for the money. I could care less about the money. Money doesn't matter to me. The money comes, I believe, after you create your respect and your reputation of who you are and what you're doing, not before. And if you put everything you're doing in terms of financial wealth, then sooner or later you're going to, A, either never have enough, greed, or you're going to lose it all, and you're going to have despair. Whereas if you simply try to lead people, right, to greener pastures, right, try to lead your family and your community and your clients to where they need to be, you, you don't have enough. 
because you can always try to take care of your community and people around you. And there's always more people to take care of. The question is, can you do that without taking care of yourself a little bit also? And that's the thing that I'm working on this year, is, is how do we maintain, right? You know, in the past, is how do we grow? How do we get to where we need to be? The question now is, how do we maintain where we're going? Because right? we're not done getting to where we need to be. Now we need to focus on maintaining it. Because then we talked about this before, you know, it's like a snowball effect, right? You've got to start the ball going. You've got to get that momentum going. But once you get the momentum going, sometimes it can go by itself now. And, we get, and I have a great team and I have a great family. Don't, I mean, this is not me, right? And when this team and this family starts rolling, I just need to stay out of their way, <laughs> right? I can come the obstacle sometimes, right? And so I got to get out of their way and, and, and support them. I got to step back and become the servant and take care of them. But that's my role as a leader is, is not to be the manager and not to be a boss. I don't need to be in the front saying, this is my group. This is not my group. I, I work for them, right? I take care of them. It's my job to serve them. They come first. And it's my job to give them the tools they need to continue doing the excellent job that they do because they are there because of who they are and what they can do, not because of what I've told them to do or not because of what I've given them to do. They have the ability to do it. I just got to get out of the way and give them the tools to succeed. To me, I prefer to think of it as leadership. And then the question becomes that you just posed to me, can you ever get to a point where you have too much leadership? You ever get to a point where you have, you're too much of a leader? And to you, I don't think so. I think you can always grow in your abilities because you're never done growing as a leader. Because I promise you, nobody knows everything. Nobody knows exactly how to do it perfectly other than one person. And that's it. You're absolutely right. I don't think there's a cap either. Because I would look at it as, okay, my family is set for life. Um, but who am I to stop when I can continue to especially in your line of work, positively impact the lives of others. Mm -hmm. If I can help, because every, you may help. What, what people struggle to understand is once you reach a certain level of status in society or a certain level of power, if you will, I think people don't have a broad enough vision to truly understand the impact that they can have, not only on the lives of others, but on the world. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks, you know, well, how much change could I possibly commence or, you know, how much of a difference could I really make? Or mm -hmm. some people, you know, oh, I'm not going to vote this year because it just, it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. It all starts in the individual and then in communities. And that's where change is sparked. And the reality of the fact is you could continue to work with clients, continue to help clients. Maybe somebody comes to you in a, a real pickle, you know, a, a financial issue related to the law, you are able to help them navigate that. And because of that, they can continue to put food on the table for a family that they have. And because of that, their great, 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 great grandchildren live a life that is completely different, all leading back to that moment in time that you were able to positively affect their life. I was blessed to be there for them when they needed somebody. Right. And that's the importance of that trust factor. The only way you garner that ability is to garner a reputation where people can trust you and what you're doing. It doesn't matter what you're doing, right? Do you clean the floors well enough that they trust you to clean the floors? Do you do your job well enough that they trust you to do the surgery that needs to be done? It doesn't matter what your job is. Do it 100%. It doesn't matter what it is, right? Especially nowadays when, and you know this, when you put something on the radio or social media or TV or and it can be seen all around the world multiple times. That one clip, that one thing can change someone's life in Romania, and you had no idea, right? So, so the question becomes, again, of why do you do what you do? You know, what is your purpose? Is it simply because you want to be seen and you're vain? Is it because you want to make money and you're greedy? Or is it because you want to provide security for your family? Is it because you need to have that yacht? <laughs> is it because you want to help your society? You get to decide, you get to define your why. And you get to define however you want to. I have no right to tell you that you can't define your why how you want to define your why. But that decides whether or not you've achieved your goal. All right? I don't know if God blessed me with any kind of talent or ability. All, right? All I know is he could bless me with life. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as I continue to wake up in the morning and have life, 
then I'm going to do my best to share that in a positive fashion. All right. So um, going back to what could become a pretty interesting conversation here, talking about society today and what we're seeing in our youth Mm -hmm. and what we're seeing really across the board. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there is some, not just youth. Yeah, not just it's not just a youth thing. I mean, the older generation loves to say, "Oh, these kids, these kids," but mm-hmm. the, the issue transcends and who raised these kids? Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. how were they raised? Yeah, and you know this. Every single person, no matter who they are, has something in their life that's not perfect. Right? It might be a parent. It might be a child. <laughs> it might be a boss. It might be you. You might have a disability. You might have whatever, but that that thing defines a little bit of your character and who you are, like what you've had to either overcome. I've chosen not to be like that person because it happened to me, or I've chosen to be like that person, right? So when we say, oh, these youth, or oh, these old people, whatever, <laughs> they picked that up from somewhere, right? They weren't born with that, that thing that you say, oh, what's, going, what's wrong with them? Either they picked it up from their education, they picked it up from some experience they had, or from someone that they had in their life that imparted that experience or education upon them. And so I don't want to hear someone say, oh, I can't, you know, I'm sorry I'm the way I am. This is what I was taught. Or, I'm sorry, this is where I came from. I'm from, the, I'm from the country. I'm from the hood. I'm from California. I'm from, I don't care, right? That's why I say I'm not going to sit here and be upset about the action. I'm going to handle the reaction because I can control myself, Right? I can choose how to react to a situation. And what that means is I can choose to change, right? If I was abused at 16, when I'm 41, I don't have to abuse my children. I, can, I can't stop what they did to me, but I can stop what I do to somebody else, right? Because I was not taught proper English at 12 doesn't mean at 50 I still have to speak the same way I did at that time. I can either use it as an excuse, which will hinder my progress, or I can use it as a catalyst to move forward my progress. It's your choice which one you do. You can't control what happened, but you control what will happen. And, and that's where I always tell my team, everyone comes into a law firm to an attorney right, with a problem. Most people don't come and say, hey, Tom, i got this great solution. They go, I've got a problem. I need help. And it's our job, it's, it's our job as attorneys and paralegals, I believe as people, to say, let me hear what the issue is, and let me work with you to find a solution for that issue. Because if all we ever do is focus on the problem, then all we do is create a bigger problem. Because nothing's being done about it. Or we're now depressed about the problem. Or now we're under a panic attack because of the problem. Or, as attorneys, people, we can say, let's address this problem with a solution, and we handle the solution. What do you believe to be some of the biggest domino problems that we're seeing in society today that need to be corrected? Um, truthfully, I think two big things, actually. Uh, Money is always the root of problems in some fashion. A lot of times with family law, a lot of times with civil law, um, even with medical situations, people can't afford health or they can't afford health, right? Money's always an issue. And, and, and you know, employees, employers, employment issues, right? And the truth is this, is that money's a problem on two fronts. It's going to be weird. Some people want too much money, right? We call that greed. Some people want too much money. And too many people are content not having any money in terms of they'll just let someone else try to take care of them. Or they go, I don't have to have, I don't need to work hard. I can go beg for money on the street. I can let the government take care of my needs. I can, I'm, I'm content with my minimum wage job. Or I'm not content with it, but I'm going to take it and then complain about it. All right? That's your choice. I just literally read an article about the new CEO of Walmart. You know what his first job was? I don't. He delivered items off of the trucks that were coming to Walmart. He took the stuff off the truck when he was in high school. Right, you can start at the bottom <laughs> and decide not to stay there. To me, don't go to McDonald's 
and demand a $15 an hour job. That's a starting job for someone that's 16 or 17 or 18 years old to learn how to do the trade. Work hard and progress up the chain. Make a decision to progress up the, up the chain. I believe it was just this past year or two years that the state of South Carolina was offering free classes at all the technical schools. Wow. Free. Don't tell me I can't get a college diploma when you have a high school diploma and it's free for you to go get an associate's degree. Well, I didn't know about that. Well, why didn't you know about that? I don't, I didn't even need it. I knew about it. Right? So don't make excuses. Excuses are problems. You're just hindering your progress. Well, I can't do that because I have a heart condition or a back condition. I had back surgery 12 years ago. I was laid up for like three months. It's taken me a year to overcome an ankle injury. I still walked around. I still did my job. I'll tell them, no, I made the decision. I could have wallowed being fired or I could have gotten up and got a job. Right? So you got two sides to that coin. The second one is just pure civility. Everyone nowadays wants to nitpick and fight with each other. Oh, look at that person's hair. Look at their gut. Look at the clothes they're wearing. Oh, look at the job they have. They have a job. Look, they have hair. I don't even have that. <laughs> right? Like, like, stop beating each other up. Like, you look at our government, you know, our leaders, right? Leaders set the example. I can care less what a leader says. Put the mute button on. And just look how they act. Look how, look how leaders of a family are husband and wife. If you don't have a husband and a wife there, you don't have a mother and father there, then you're missing a leader. Right? Look, at, at my house, I have Lauren. She helps me lead the family, right? Leah and William are there with her. A lot of the time, out of the day, I have to trust her and she has to trust me to be leaders of the family. At my office, I have Aubrey. I have an office manager. I'm not there right now. I have to trust her to be there. Right? I have to have her there. So when one of my leaders is missing, then you're missing a key component of what makes our society function. Right? When all of our leaders in D.C. or Columbia or your city government, whatever they do, can't get along and they can't work together for the betterment of society, then they set the tone for everyone that elects them because they're called representatives for a reason. Right? So when you're electing people that represent you by bickering and fighting and putting each other down, whether you're a conservative like Donald Trump or you're a Democrat liberal like Biden, when you can't reach across the aisle and say, I'm going to work with you, even if I don't 100% agree with you, I'm going to work with you to make this country the best it possibly can be, then you're setting a tone of lack of civility and a lack of progress. Right? And a lot of people are going to say, well, well you know, Tom, you know, we want what's best. And, and we want what's best. Yeah, that's your perspective. <laughs> they have a different perspective. Are you looking at it from their side? Are they looking at it from your side? And is there a way to find that together? Because you're never going to have 100% your way ever. You're never going to have 100% their way ever. So how about we work together and do what's best for this country? You're absolutely right. right. What would have happened, right, in 1776, right, when, when people stood up and said, you know, I disagree with you, so I'm not going to fight with you. I'm not going to reach across the aisle and band together to form this country. Forget you. Forget what you think. I'm going to fight against you instead of fighting for the country. Would we have a country? Probably not. But now 300 years later, <laughs> all we do is fight with each other. That's all we do. Until Russia or China decides, wow, look at that place over there. They're, they seem pretty available. <laughs> it's because we have the privilege to do so. There are a lot of countries where you do not have the privilege to worry about what gender is using what bathroom, mm -hmm. where you don't get to worry about allocating billions of taxpayer dollars for research <laughs> to for R and D expenses or whatever you want to call it. You don't have the privilege to make those decisions. The United States is. We are a privileged country. You can come here from anywhere with nothing and make something of yourself. The American dream. And what we're looking at unfolding right now and what just in my own personal belief we're probably going to see unfold in the next year, year or two 
financially, you know, the markets, socially, is, you know, we're going to see some people that are going to be suffering. There's going to be some hard times. And going back to what you were stating before, you know, the reality is during the most trying times for the market or for financial, financially speaking, the ones, the, the, the upper class go unfazed. If anything, they make more money than ever because they're buying things for pennies on the dollar, whether it be stocks, real estate, what have you. It's all on sale. That's exactly right. So they get to not only survive and really it's a drop in the bucket to them. It's not even a big deal and they get to thrive. And you say that, but it's also a risk they're willing to take. Correct. Right? They're willing to take that risk. And most of the time they're where they are because they took that risk to get there. And so they're continuing that behavior. Whereas a lot of people that are just trying to survive don't want to give up that security blanket. Correct. Right. So there is risk involved in that concept. But you're 100 right. And when you have an upper class that can maintain at least if they wanted to, if they just no offense involved, they're going to make it through. You have your lower class, which kind of they're going to suffer. And then you have your middle class. And, you know, with that, that lower class or people below the poverty line, I feel like a huge problem that we're having today is what incentive do we have for them to step over that line and fight for the middle class when the middle class continually is taken from, mm -hmm. when it's taken advantage of? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some people in some positions that I almost can't blame for whether you want to call it playing the victim or, or being content in where they are, because there's some people that they could go get a minimum wage job and be making less than what they're making at home. Mm -hmm. 100%. That happens all the time. Uh, you know, there was a recent stat that was put out in South Carolina. You know, 100,000 available jobs. And of the number of people that are able to work, one-third said that they would not work because they make more money not working than by working. That's a problem. You're de-incentivizing work, right? And so my issue with that is this, and this is just my perspective, of course, and that's what we're talking about. Yeah. This government, state, federal, whatever, is a job, okay? And, and this country, the state, is a job. So in order for you to see it as a job, try this analogy. We as residents, as citizens, are the customers, Right, and we pay for that through what's called taxes. Right, so you know you're going to the store. We're a customer. We're buying a shirt. We pay with cash. Right, so we're going over buying stuff from the state and the government um, with our cash. That's taxes. Right, the managers of that store are the people we elect. They manage the store. The owners of the store, the people that run the store, right? Presidents, governors are the ones that have the overall authority of the store. Right, there they are. The, the courts, right, the board of directors, they kind of decide what should be done, what shouldn't be done, right? And, and so what are we buying, right, as customers from this business of government? We're buying the opportunity that they should be providing to us, and we're, we're buying the protection of that opportunity, right, through the military or whatever needs it is. But what we're doing now as a business is we're going to our customers and saying, you don't need to buy anything. You don't need to work. Don't bother coming to the store. We're going to give it to you. No, no, you don't need to spend anything on it. You don't need to work hard for it and you know, make money to buy stuff from the store. We're just going to give you everything. So if I'm going to give you everything from my store, why are you coming to my store to buy anything? You're not, right? So, so a third of our workforce is saying, look, the store, the government's just giving me everything I need. I don't need to come buy anything from you. And because I don't need to come buy anything from you, now the store's suffering because there's not enough people to buy stuff. We're not enough people to work. We're not enough people to do anything. And then now the money's not coming into the store and it's all going out of the store. So now instead of you making money and being able to take care of the opportunities, the military, the protection of those opportunities, you're just giving it all away for free. And so what's going to happen is instead of people working hard and caring about it, 
They're just going to expect right, the privilege. They're going to expect just to get it for free. Hey, here's your free lollipop. Now give it back to me. No, I'm not giving you back my lollipop. You gave it to me. No, but, but I need it because I can't afford it anymore. Well, too bad. It's fine. No one's going to no want to revert back to working hard when they didn't have to work hard. And it's not going to slowly go the other direction. It's going to keep going in that direction. Because what's going to happen is it's going to become an expectation. It's going to become a privilege. And so what's going to happen with the next generation, the next generation, they're going to say, well, why are we being treated unfairly and different? Why aren't we getting free stuff? Well, let's file a lawsuit and get more free stuff. Let's say that's unconstitutional, even though it's not in the Constitution. Right? Let, let's, you, you need to reward me for what happened to my grandma and my grandpa. Well, that happened to you. It doesn't matter. Like, I want free stuff. And, and because you're unwilling to work hard for that free stuff, now the government's going to have to get that payment for that free stuff from those that are working, which is a dwindling group of people, which means they're going to have to pay more so that the growing group of people that get free stuff, you can keep giving them free stuff. Because instead of it becoming an opportunity of representation, now it becomes an expectation of a job for those that we elect. They're no longer there representing you and your country. They're there for the job. And they're getting paid for it, too. And they're, getting, they're, they're expecting to make more money, too. And so it's going to be a continuous catalyst of a rising pendulum that soon is going to collapse back down. And when it collapses, that's going to be the problem. And when that is, I don't know. There seems to be a lot of conversations that I hear on a day-to-day about the government in, in this fashion, as well as the number of business owners that I've spoken with in the past year. The number one complaint is that, oh, we, we can't find any good help. Mm-hmm. We, we can't find people to work. And like, oh, it's this generation, they just don't have a work ethic or this, that, or the other thing. I think, to be honest with you, the problem is quite the contrary. What we really have in both senses, whether it be governmental or business, is we have a lack of leadership. Mm -hmm. How can you expect people to follow you when you're leading them in an aimless pursuit? Part of the the job of of a leader or of a visionary, if you will, is to not only select the destination based upon your intuition or your gut instinct. But it is also to inspire others to follow you. Mm-hmm. And rather than, you know, we, we, look at, we look at warfare in the way that it used to be waged. And oftentimes, the leader on a battlefield led the charge. Mm-hmm. And that was leading through action. Mm-hmm. Now we have an awful lot of leaders on aimless pursuit or not, that are crying from the rooftops about, you know, why won't anyone follow me? Why won't anyone follow me? Follow me this way. As opposed to, well, maybe if you just started walking, maybe if you just started doing the things that you are trying to get others to do, you know, if you, if you want good employees, create a good business that works with good people, that makes a positive impact. I, th- I think it's this victim mentality that seems to be crippling everyone and governmentally as well. One could argue. If you want good employees, be a good employee, right? No, no employer is ever good at being a leader. If they can't first follow, right? If I say son to William, I need you to clean up your room. And he goes, my room, and it's a complete mess. What kind of tone am I setting as a leader? Right? Hey, I need to show up at the office from 9 to 5 and get this work done. And I don't show up for two straight weeks. What kind of tone am I setting for my team? Right? A leader, by definition, leads. And I truly believe that wins a law, and for me, a leader leads sometimes by getting out of the way, right? Sometimes you have to be out front because you're catching the bullets, right? When a leader on the battlefield leads, they're in the front because they're showing their team that they have so much trust in them that they will catch the bullets first for them, right? It's my job to take the heat. It's 
my job to take the bad stuff. If a client wants to call up or someone's upset with, about something, they're talking to me. They don't need to deal with my team. They need to deal with me. I'm in the front. However, when it comes time for accolades, when it t- comes time for recognition, when it comes time to be fed, I'm in the back. I always will be rewarded last. I always will, will take the heat first. That's a leader. Right? The problem we have is the converse situation in our current society is that everyone wants to get the accolades. All of our governmental representatives, all of our business leaders want to be out front and center. Right? Look at the big ones. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, here we go. You ready? Name one other person that works at any of those other companies. All those companies I just named, name one other person that works at those companies. Can't name one. Right? Because they want to get all the accolades. They want you to know who they are. They want the recognition. Yet, I promise you, Donald Trump, when things are bad, it's not their fault. I didn't do it. <laughs> it was X. I'm going to fire him. <laughs> right? wasn't me. Right? Look at our government leaders. Look at our economy. We're doing great. Look at this. We're doing great. Yay. Vote for me. Well, what about the border? That's not me. That's, that's the border chief. That's not me. That's the vice president. That's not me. I, that bad stuff's not me. That's, that's them. Good stuff, me. Bad stuff, not me. That's not a leader. That's not someone that you want leading you. When all they're going to do is take all the credit for what you do and then give you all the crap that you got put into because that's where they put you. right? A leader's job is to set a destination. Not, not necessarily an exact place. right? Like for the firm, you know, wins the law. It's not, I'm not telling them we're going to end up making $5 million this year. I'm telling them we're going to move forward. The destination is to move forward. We might make a dollar more than last year, but we still move forward. Our goal team is to work together, committed to each other, to move forward. And not only are we moving forward for the business, we're moving forward to our clients. We want to help our clients. We're moving forward for our community. What service are we going to do to our community? And we're going to move forward together, right? Next week, the firm internally, we're going to start a finance class so I can help my team budget their money. I have a lot of my team that are young single mothers, young people of this generation we're talking about who are hard workers. And they want to succeed, right? And so it's my job not only to help them succeed as a paralegal or as an employee, but as a person, right? And so after hours, if they choose to stay, We'll be working through a financial class on how to best manage their money, how to invest their money, how to take the retirement account we give them. And so that way when they're not 20 anymore and they're 60, that account over 40 years has grown to the point where they're as rich as they want to be, right? What are you willing to do as a leader to put other people first and not yourself? That's where we are, is that the role has become redefined to what it's never been supposed to be defined in the first place. And it's interesting as well by putting others first. It all comes back. It all comes back. It's exactly what you say, you know, give 100% to everyone and it's infinite what you can get in return. Mm-hmm. Because you you help you help your employees to lead a smarter financial life in their personal realm or maybe you have an employee that comes in that's having difficulty with their spouse and you're just an ear Mm -hmm. you know you're just listening you're able to help them deal with problems outside of work which you know you're not getting paid to do but in doing so you're able to help them to solve those problems because to think that people's personal lives doesn't affect how they show up for work Ludicrous, and, and I'm sure you're part, you're not even married, but I'm already, sure you heard it right. Happy wife, happy life, yep. right? Happy employees, happy workplace. If you show up to work every day and every employee there is miserable and doesn't like being there, it doesn't sound like a very fun place to work. But if they show up going, you know what? And I hope they do this. That wins a lot, right? You know, what? I know that Tom and Aubrey are looking out for our interest. Like I know that if I need something personally, professionally. Whatever it is, they're going to be there. And what I love is last night when I was working to midnight or one, I got back to the office about 8 o'clock because I went home and saw my kids and my wife, like I do. 
And I had employees working there at 8 o'clock at night. Over the weekend, right, which was a three-day weekend, I worked Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. All three days were off. I had at least four employees that I saw at the office that weekend on days off. I didn't tell them to be there. And you know this about me. Uh, I check emails at night. Mm-hmm. And when I say at night, I mean like 11 till 2 a.m. And I will have people email me back, including you, at night, not because you have to, but hopefully because you know that I would do the same thing for you. Right? And it's that mutual sign of respect that you say, I don't have to do this, but I know he would do it for me, and so I'm going to do this. Right? And that's, to me, that trust relationship. Right? I want to work with these people. Like, I love working with you. I love working with my team. I love working with my wife. And I want them to understand that I will give them 100%. And because of that, I want to believe they will give me back 100%. Now, will they work till 2 a.m.? I don't want them to. <laughs> right? I don't need them to. I know you will. <laughs> but I don't need them to. Right? But I know that on their schedule, through their perspective, they're willing to give me what I'm willing to give them. And I might have another level. I might have another gear. I might be a little bit different. I might like that risk that they don't like. And I accept that because we're all different people. Like, I don't try to have a team that's all me because that would be ridiculous. I could not imagine that. <laughs> you probably have to take the, the firm global or right. else it would just get. <laughs> right? Right. But I want a team that compensates for each other's weaknesses because I have so many weaknesses that if I don't recognize my weaknesses, then I will be stuck in a situation where I think I'm fantastic and I'm great, right? I won't have anyone tell me that I'm bald and ugly, right? Like, I need people to tell me that I'm wrong, right? Because if everyone just says yes to you, then you're always going to be wrong. You can never get better, right? And that's how businesses get better when, they're get, when people are told they're wrong. There's another way to go about doing the situation. That's the beauty because when you have a team of different people, you have a whole bunch of different perspectives. And when you analyze those perspectives, you can logically come up with the best solution. That's what I want. I want a team, I want a family, I want people that say, Tom, I think um, we can do social media this way. Because I don't know how to do it. And if I try to pretend like I do, I'm probably going to screw it up. But at the same time, if I say, hey, we probably should do the trial this way, then maybe I might know what I'm talking about a little bit. Right? That's why we, at the firm we always say, you know, we've got two rules. You know, See, you're going to do it, do it. See, you're going to be there, be there. That's it. Be mature, be an adult, allow me to trust and lean on you. That's simple. If I can't trust you to be where you say you're going to be and you can't do what you say you're going to do, isn't that the crux of where we are as a society of being committed to each other? Right? Our, rep- our representatives always say, we will get X done. No, you won't. <laughs> it doesn't matter what they say. What politician says, I will give you lower taxes. And we go, yay. No, we go, no, you won't. Yep. As soon as they say it, we say, no, we don't trust you. Is that really what we want in the people we rep- that represent us? We, we know as soon as they say something, they're liars. That's who, we, that's who we hire to represent us, liars. Is that what you want your boss to be? Is that what you want your spouse to be? Is that what you want your father or mother to be? Or do you want someone that says, okay, doesn't matter what time of day it is, doesn't matter where it is, it will get done. I know Tom has an email at 8 p.m., I know by 8 a.m. it'll be answered every day. Every day I will check every email and every voicemail. I pulled up here. I was in the truck yep. making some phone calls because I had I to get the phone, right? <laughs> I still got three more to make. But we'll get it done. It'll be done. It's very interesting to, um, you know, the more and more I get to know you, the more I see similarities. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> But, you know, the reality is, you know, my upbringing, very small town, I didn't have a lot of people necessarily. I probably went all the way through maybe even since till I moved down here. You know, I was 24 years of age before I met someone where I was like, man, I'm, I'm kind of, I can see an equal level of delusion almost. Like delusional aptitude towards like, hey, there's, this thing over here, I promise you I can see it. I promise you we can build it. We can do it. Follow me. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's, I, I got the greatest compliment I've ever gotten 
two months ago from a friend of mine. And we were sitting down and having this conversation and he was just asking about some, some things that I had planned and, and just some, I was giving him what I had in the, in the books for the next five, 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me and he said, you're delusional. Mm-hmm. And it was the greatest compliment I had ever been given. Because I never, I've never aimed to be realistic. Mm-hmm. I never did. Uh, I, I've always been a bit of a dreamer, I guess, or whatever you want to call it. And, but it's funny to me because I think a lot of, a lot of the times we look at these leaders or, or leaders in society and we put them on these pedestals of think all, know all of like, they're these very intelligent individuals. But I've told people before, I am the smartest dumb person you will ever meet because I, the, the number one thing that I'm smart about is being smart about accepting what I do not know and not being afraid to ask the right questions to the right people that do know. I'm not going to, if, if I have a legal question, I'm going to give Winslow Law a call. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give Tom a call. Yay. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to sit there and try and figure it out. Yeah. Um, because I'll get nowhere. That's the hardest part of life, Colton. It, and it's the hardest part of being an entrepreneur. And you kind of know this, you know, I was told you can either spend your time or you can spend your money, but you can't spend both. Um, and I didn't understand what that meant, but it's true. Because when you're starting off a business, right? I start off with two attorneys and a paralegal. You start off you know, by yourself, right? And you said, I'm going to do a podcast studio. And you did what you could. And then as time grew, you did more. And as time grew, you added more. And you did more. And what I've had to learn as, a, as an adult, which, right, I didn't know as a child, <laughs> I didn't know when I started the business, was that there are people that actually know how to do what you're trying to do, right? Like, I could not do this. This is not me. If I tried to do this, we'd still be trying to do this, <laughs> okay? Like, not my forte, right? But, I would, but 20 years ago, I would have tried to do it myself. And it would not have turned out how it turned out for you. But if you went and got you know, five years from now, when you had the money or the assets and the ability to do it, a master carpenter to do it, it'd be even better than it is now. Which doesn't say anything about what your work is. It just says what you're good at and what you're not good at. Because if that master carpenter tried to do what you do, you couldn't do that either. Right? And so what that means to me is this, is that we have to understand what we can and can't do. And what I'm best at is knowing I can't do anything. I can't be a mom, so I got to trust my wife to be a mom. <laughs> I cannot be an office manager. I got to trust Aubrey to be an office manager. I cannot write those briefs as well as some of my attorneys. I'm going to trust my attorneys to write those briefs. Right? I cannot do what my paralegal Bree does. Right? I can't do it. Right? But they have to have trust that I can do things that they can't do, such as do the stuff in court, take the depositions, give the interviews, stuff of that nature. Right, so there's mutual understanding and uh, acceptance of your role. Some attorneys don't want to be in front of the camera, and some attorneys do. And, and if you're not someone that wants to be in front of the camera, don't get in front of the camera. Find a partner, find someone that you can lean on that you trust to do the work you can't do, and just lean on each other. Because I promise you, that attorney that says I'm great at everything, isn't <laughs> <laughs> right. That, that person, that spouse, that friend, whatever, that says, I can do it all, can't. And they just don't understand that. And, and when you're young, you don't feel that way. And as you get older, you start accepting that reality. And, and the truth is, is, you know, I'm 40. When I'm 50 and 60, there's going to be probably less that I can do then than I can do now. Probably because of the work I'm putting in now, I'll be able to afford, right, not my time but my money, to have people that can actually do the job even better than I am today. And if that's true, then I'll adapt and I'll phase into that next step, right? So I, I never have a plan. And it sounds great. You never have a plan. I have, I have objectives. I have goals. I have destinations. But exactly how we're going to get there, this is the plan, A, B, C, D. I don't have that because it never goes that way. I've learned there, no plan will ever be A through Z perfect. And so what I've chosen is we're going to have a destination. We're going to get there. And we're just going to work our way through it. We'll work our way through it. We'll get there. We'll make it work. As long as we're all 
rowing the boat together, we'll make it work. Do you view yourself as an ambitious individual? I view myself as someone that's never content. I'm not, um, I'm always satisfied. If my life ended today, I'd be happy with it. And if my life ended tomorrow where I had zero dollars to my name, I'd be happy with it. But I'm never content not striving for better. I will never be perfect. I accept that. But I never have to be content with imperfection either. And so I tell my wife all the time, I'll never be perfect, but it doesn't stop me from striving to be perfect. I always try to be better. And, and, and I don't know, honestly, what that means. Right? Like, and you might have seen this, you might know this, but uh, I, know some, uh, I know a photographer, a gentleman who takes pictures, and um, someone came to me last year and said, hey, Tom, you need some pictures on your walls. I was like, okay. And then I saw this guy who was like, hey, I want to have a studio, I want to have a gallery somewhere. I said, huh, okay. And so earlier this year, we set up a gallery at my office, right? Where he and I came to a business arrangement where he could use my space as a gallery and I could get a percentage of whatever he sells off of it, off of my blank walls that needed decoration anyway. I didn't plan on that happening last year or this year, but there was an opportunity to better him and, and as a person and as a professional. There was an opportunity to better the community who wanted this gallery. There was an opportunity to better the firm who needed the pictures, an opportunity to better the finances through the percentage. So I'm always going to look for that opportunity to become better, to take advantage of those opportunities that arise. And sometimes they're going to, they're going to fail. Right? Like this year, I plan on having two books being published this year. I, they, might, they might stink, but hey, take a shot. Right now, even for today, I started writing my third book that I'm working on. That probably won't come out for two more years. But you know what? Why not have something else to do? All right? Keep pushing. Try. Can we talk a little bit more about the books? Talk about whatever you want to talk about. All right. So you said you're starting to work on number three. Yes, I got two being published this year and number three probably in a year or two. Two being published this year. And how long have those been in the making? Um, so one I wrote in 2020. And one I wrote, or started writing, I shouldn't say wrote, when I started writing, Right before COVID. So was that probably 2019, I would imagine? Yep. Um, and so 2019, actually, uh, the one book I started writing when I was on vacation to Ireland, because I can't go on vacation and do nothing. That's boring. Of course. <laughs> so I had my had an old school dictation like, you know, recorder. And so we would go to these like sites. So it was Ireland. So we would go to these sites, and we'd be walking around, and I'd be dictating this book and these chapters in this book. I'm walking around these historical sites. And Lauren's like, Tom, just take in the scenery. I'm like, I am. I can talk <laughs> and take in the scenery at the same time. And then um, we started editing it and started working on it a little bit. And then um, last year, maybe, maybe it was last year, Colton, we went to, um, had a client offer us his home uh, for a week in Luke Payne's Bill, uh, for a week down in Key West, in yep. the Keys somewhere. And uh, while I was there for a week, um, I added some to it. And I, we finally finalized the editing. And so, February, March, that happened. So over the past nine months, we've been working with the editor on getting it kind of cleaned up and put together and hopefully published come this summer, give or take. What What are the books about? So the first one is a children's book that I wrote for my children um, in regard to kind of some of these values of life that we've talked about. But it's a picture book that we had illustrated. So really cool. I'll show it to you when it comes out. Uh, the second one, is my feeling on the law. And so it's a completely different kind of law book. You, know, you always hear the practice of law. And, and they always say the practice of law is because you'll never get it right. You know, it's always practicing. It's never perfect. You always get it right. And I disagree because from the actual law itself, right, the trying of cases, the law itself will always be changing. That's why it's always practice. However, that's one side of the law. The other side that gets neglected, right, is the counseling side, right? The, the litigation side, the counseling side, the attorney and counselor at law. The counseling side always gets neglected because the counseling side has to do with the actual client themselves, right? And how you're treating the client, how you're treating your coworkers, how you're treating the people around you. And so this one's kind of a, a circulation around the art of law in regard of the counseling aspect, how you handle the people involved in the law because the people involved in the law, to me, are way more important than simply the file, involved in the law because without the people you will never have a file 
right? So how do you actually treat the people? How do you treat coworkers, clients, opposing counsel, judges? What can you learn from them? It's taking a look from the opposite side, right? A different perspective of what the law is. It gets so neglected, right? That's why we always talk about the counseling. No one talks about the counseling of the law anymore. It's always law firm, attorney. So you're not taking care of the actual person anymore? Let's focus on taking care of the people. And that's kind of what the book's about. Has writing a book or multiple, as you said, has that always been something you thought that you would do? Or no. is there a point in your life where you could never have imagined yourself writing a book? I thought I'd write a book for <laughs> children. <laughs> like, actually, um, I read so much during the day, right? And I read a bunch of, like, articles and you know, many stories and, like, many uh, soliloquies about, you know, stoicism and stuff of that nature. Um, but reading and writing to a point bores me because there's so much fluff. Yep. Right? And I'm not a fluff person. Like, get to the point. Like, I don't have time for your character development <laughs> and your plot making. Like, let's understand what the purpose of this story is. So I was always told I was not a good writer because I was like, there's a rainbow. I don't care what color it is. Everybody knows what colors of the rainbow are. There it is, <laughs> right? And so I had to learn to add that description into it. And I had to learn that you know, even as an attorney, right? And it's like, how do you not just tell a story? Because people, people feel things through different mechanisms, right? Some people feel things from hearing it. Some people feel it from seeing it. Some people feel it from actually like touching it. Like, you know, they, they, it's an emotional response. And so in order to appeal to a jury, right, which is divine, made up by 12 different people of different backgrounds, you have to find a way to connect with each one of them. All right? And there's going to be one or two people that are like, this is boring, get to the point. There's going to be two or three other people that are like, oh, I want to see the picture, the, the artist, right? Oh, I want to hear about it. That's really important. I want to feel it. I want that emotional connection, right? So you're going to have four or five different subgroups on a jury. So when you're writing a story and you're telling a story, it's the same concept. You've got to be able to touch each one of those audience members that's reading that book because not every attorney, not every person, not every professional that's going to read the book is the same as me. And so, no, I never thought I'd do that. Um, and I never thought I'd write a book for my children, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't draw the pictures, but I wrote the book. <laughs> you didn't draw the pictures. No, I, I, my, uh, my wife's cousin drew the pictures. She did such a good job. Her name is wow. Rebecca. She did such a good job and we paid her to do the pictures and they're so cute uh, <laughs> for kids. Mine would be stick figures. Yeah, but you and me Know both. what you're good at, know what you're not good at. <laughs> Amen. Amen. No one to outsource. <laughs> no one to outsource. <laughs> um, so when it comes to the process of introducing, you know, a, a book to the world, um, you know, that's a very, it's a very interesting thing. I, I had this, I guess you could call it an epiphany, but that sounds a little too smart for me. But this, this kind of moment where I was reading this book, I'm, I'm currently reading a book on Alexander the Great. And I'm reading the about- great stoic. The a great stoic. I'm a, I'm a stoic myself, That's big time. I indulge on philosophy quite regularly. Uh, but I was reading this and- as I'm reading about this great individual in history that accomplished a great many things, I came to the realization that I was reading about an individual from so long ago. And it's so interesting how like the written word is passed on. And then I started to even think about like now where we have the number one way people are consuming content and context, if you will, is platforms like TikTok, mm -hmm. where it's you have 30 to 60 seconds to make a point, and then it pretty much gets lost. Mm -hmm. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And there's there's really is a place for the written word in that it kind of, it, it transcends a lot of these new age ways of getting a point across. I always will see video and, and things like that. Like, you know, there's movies that people have watched for ages, but you look at written word, it's a really cool thing to think, you know, when you go, there might be somebody reading your book or inside of your head, you know, envisioning your thoughts. That might be dangerous. With all 
<laughs> you know, the, the beauty of um, being able to write a book, being able to tell a story from your perspective, right? And it might be a historical, even a biography, you're telling it from that person's life from your perspective. Right? An autobiography, they're telling it from their own perspective. Right? Um, writing a children's book, that story is being told from my perspective for an audience, right? And, and, and if there's value in that to somebody, just even like today, this is our perspective. If there's value in that, uh, where it, it helps somebody achieve a goal or to better their life or to say, you know what, I can view it from a different avenue. I didn't think about it like that. Right? It's kind of the role of an attorney is to say, well, this is my problem. I don't really know how to view it. And then I try to redefine the problem to find that solution. Right? And it's kind of almost a little bit what the, this third book's going to be. It's helping to redefine that. And so I don't view it as a book. And it sounds weird. I don't view it as a book. I view it as a page. Right? And, and it's like a to-do list. Right? When you have 20 things to do, you get overwhelmed with having 20 things to do. You're like, I'm never going to get all of it done. And what I always say to do is just stack it up. You, you lay 20 things out on a desk, it looks like a whole lot, but you stack it up in one pile. You just got one pile. It's just one stack. You got a whole bunch of clean space on your desk. It's just one pile of paper. You take that first sheet off and you do the first sheet. You take the second sheet and you do the second sheet, right? So for this third book, the, the goal is this year to write one paragraph a day. Beautiful. That's it. It's not a book. I'm not writing a book. I'm writing a paragraph a day, four sentences, five sentences a day. If I write more, great. If I write less, I'm not going to kill myself about it. If I do one a day, right, 365 paragraphs, uh, it should be about done. And I might not even need that many, or I might need more. But if I can accomplish 365 paragraphs, that's a pretty good day. That's so. Right? And so, and so that's how I just handle the life. You know, it's never an accumulation of having to do everything all at one time. It's just doing one thing multiple times. Get one thing done and do it again and do it again do it again and then you just work your way through life and kind of drives you where you're going it keeps pushing you forward because you're still doing something you're still pushing forward and hopefully you never run out of stuff to do if you do you find other stuff to do you run out of stuff to do i think <laughs> you've got some bigger problems got some bigger problems i'd be laying flat <laughs> you don't know <laughs> yep <laughs> you mentioned stoicism so i have to ask have you have you read Meditations by yes. Marcus Aurelius. That's the, that's the start that of Stoicism. East, I was going to say, it's really, I mean, that book had a massive impact on my life. How do you define Stoicism? What, just real simple for a layman, what, what would you say it is? I look at it as not, I think a lot of people refer to it as a belief system where it's less a belief system and more a structural way of living your life with virtue, yeah. a way to pursue a meaningful life and to have a positive impact. So, and that a lot of the, the fundamental pillars of that are things such as discipline, such as understanding philosophy in general, like actually thinking through things and understanding things, pursuing things worth pursuing, not necessarily being led by your emotions. It's redefining how you can control your life without your life controlling you, hmm. right? Yep. Uh, and that's where a lot of, I guess, a lot of my belief comes from. If you, if, you know, as you hear me talk, right, Stoicism basically says, you know, Alexander the Great, right? You know, he had all kinds of problems and issues. He had to find solutions to those problems and issues. He never would allow the problems to control and paralyze his ability to accomplish what he needed to accomplish, right? Uh, you know, Hannibal and Marcus Aurelius, you know, it's saying I'm going to do what I can and I'm not going to let what I can't do define me, right? And I think, as you stated, meditations, is, you know, that's the start of it, but just using the word meditation is the whole purpose of meditation. And it's to say I'm going to relax. <laughs> I'm just going to do what I can do. I'm not going to worry about it, right? And, that, and that's, again, to me, kind of the crux of what we've been talking about. I'm just going to roll. Things aren't going to go perfect. No one plans on having a car accident. I've had car accidents. No one plans on getting the speeding ticket. I've had speeding tickets. Right? No one plans on having a legal issue. But there's someone that knows how to handle it, right? That's why there's attorneys. That's why we're there, right? You, you learn through life and through stoicism how to handle situations and how to turn those situations into positive developments. And we've talked about this before. 
because most of my positive developments have come from negative uh, developments. And it's all based on the reaction I've had that's made it positive. We talked about that earlier with starting the firm. Right? How do you handle a negative? Do you handle a negative with a negative or do you handle a negative by turning it into a positive? What's your reaction? As we are coming close to our conclusion in the podcast episode, I want to ask some legal questions that have been uh, tugging at my brain cells here. All right. Free legal advice coming up. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so have you ever had a situation or a case that you were working where your personal morals got in the way of your ability to do what was best for the client? Um, I'm going to give you two responses to that. One, I have the blessing to be able to choose the cases I want to take. Now, sometimes courts will appoint you to cases, and I've not had that situation arise where I'm appointed to a case, um, you know, child sex abuse. I can choose not to take that case. And so I've not had to put myself in that situation because if I don't want to take the case, I'm not taking the case. But number two is this. Uh, I have taken cases that made me uncomfortable because everyone deserves to be represented. Right? If you're being sued, whether I, I think you're right or wrong, whether I like what you did, you still deserve to be represented. You're still innocent until proven guilty. Right? Um, and, and, and it's my duty, you know, this is the responsibility I took on, whether I like it or not, to be a voice and to uphold the Constitution, to uphold what I believe justice prevails. And that might mean that you come to me and, and we need to resolve your case because you don't deserve what you think you deserve or because you have a situation that I'm not getting you out of, but I need to mitigate the amount of damage that you're going to suffer. Right? And, and so many attorneys nowadays, I believe, put a focus on winning the case or winning or losing. And to me, it's not a game. You win and lose in a game. Okay, this is not a sport. This is someone's life. This is justice. This is our country. This is our, our foundation. And therefore, it's my duty to uphold as much of that as I possibly can. And so uh, that's where a lot of my problems with it. our current state of attorneys and law firms, when their perspective is, I've got to win at all costs. No, you don't. That's why we have a reputation like we do. You need to provide your responsibilities and your duties to your client, but also to the system and to the Constitution to uphold our values and our morals of this country. And too many people forget it's not a game, and they just want to win. As far as cases are concerned and the, the selection process, what goes into the process of selecting cases? Are you looking at, at them from a hundred different angles of, well, this case, you know, I'm sure there's a, a lot of firms out there that do not take cases that they don't know there's a 90% chance that they can win yeah. because they don't want that stain on their reputation. Mm -hmm. Even when those people still need help. Mm -hmm. And then what you might have is those people going to the next place down the street and getting subpar help. And now their odds go from 60% to 30%. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some of the thought processes that go into the selection of these cases? And of course, I'm, I'm sure as well as like manpower, you know, you only can take so many cases without, you know, having unrest within your team. Mm -hmm. What does that process look like? You know, I, I'm blessed again with a great team, right? And, and, you, and you a little bit know this. We create a structure within the firm where everyone has a role to play. And so I have a great uh, customer service manager. Our, our front desk is in charge of our customer service. And so they actually are that first level uh, of care for our clients. Uh, second level is our intake coordinator. Uh, she does a fantastic job. Uh, Aunt Tiffy does a great job at her position. She understands it. Um, and she's that second level. Uh, third level is me. And then we can actually get down to the other attorneys and the other paralegals, right? So what plays into are we going to take a case? So last year we had over 3,000 
potential cases come in. We call them PNCs, potential new cases come in. We end up only taking 28% of those cases, right? So one out of every four, basically, give or take. And some of those were as, I don't say as simple as wills, right, where you're just helping someone put a will together to as complex as medical malpractice, right? So you might take 100% of will intakes because they didn't will. You might take one out of 10 of medical malpractice. And so you just don't know really what those percentages are. So what are we taking? Uh, really three qualifications now. You know, when you're starting a firm, you might take every case you can, <laughs> right? But now we're looking at three things. One, you as a person, you as a client, do we want to work with you? Right. Are you going to treat my team properly? Right. And then the converse is true. Can we treat you properly? Can we provide to you what you need? Right. And then for me, the third thing is not about winning and losing. It's about can we actually benefit you? And that's, again, to me, where we are a little bit different. And I've said this with you before, is... It does not do me any good to take your case when you, I know you can win your case. I know you have a winnable case for $15,000, right? You have a contract dispute, something's come up with $15,000 and file it and cost you $25,000 in expenses. It doesn't do any good, right? So do I go file it in small claims court where we can get at least some of your money back and it'll cost you less money? Do I just tell you, hey, just go get what you can and try to resolve this yourself? because they might be willing to offer you something if I'm not involved in it, right? It doesn't do me any good to charge you $25,000 and then give you a check for $15,000, right? So can I actually benefit you, right? And that's that counselor part, right? Because as an attorney, attorney and counselor at law, as an attorney, I can win your case, but as a counselor, I can actually help you, right? And, and that's that perspective I, I want to believe of putting the client first, above the file. Yeah, I can win, but can I benefit? And that's And that's to me, the primary function of serving a client and my team. Because if we're going to have a relationship together and we're going to be working together, we got to have a relationship where we actually like each other. Like, you got to like me and I got to like you. And if you don't trust me and I don't trust you or you're calling up yelling at people or, or no one wants to take your call or you don't want to take my call, we're not going to work well together either. All right? So can we have a mutual relationship where we benefit each other? That, that's the qualification. That comes in. Uh, and none of that has to do with the law, right? I'll analyze the law. Every attorney does the law. I'll analyze the law. But a lot of that has to do with the actual person and the file and the client. And, and when a case takes three to four years to resolve, you got to be willing to deal with each other for three to four years. My final question. Mm. Mm. Famous last words. Famous last words. <laughs> um, being that we are currently sitting in front of cameras and recording into microphones, and this is going to go out to the World Wide Web, where, as you know, be it a good thing or a bad thing, the things that we choose to put out there are going to be out there for a damn long time. For the people in your life, maybe even your children, who may be watching this podcast 10, 15, 20 60 years from now, you might be gone. What would your message be? You know, that comes back to where we started this whole podcast of what is your why? Right? Your message should be your why. Why are you a father? Why are you a husband? Why are you an employer? Why are you an attorney? And, and so the message is this. I want people to say that he made my life better. Not that he you know, jumped in planes, not that he ran with bulls, not that he did any of that stuff. Not that he was a father. There's a lot of people that are fathers that don't make their children's lives better, right? But because he was willing, he made my life better. And then I hope they don't remember me at all. And I hope they remember the people that are around me that I hope were able to achieve or progress or get a little bit better because I was willing to give them what God was willing to give me, right? And, and because I was willing to impart upon them what God was willing to impart upon me, now they have succeeded and progressed where they have given their children and their businesses and their customers and their community even more than they could have without what we were able to do at One Soul Law. 
So, so what would be my message? That he gave 100% to everyone that was around him. And because of that, my life was better. And that hopefully it's my wife, and hopefully that's my kids, and hopefully that's my friends and my, my team and my clients and hopefully my parents, right? Because if, if we were to say that about everyone around us, if everyone could say about the person next to them, that person makes my life better, how great would we be? So I can just contribute a little bit to that. I'll take that. I'll take that as my win. <laughs> You'll be ready to go then, huh? I'm ready to go now, baby. <laughs> just got to figure out a fun way to do it. <laughs> That's true. Uh, you mentioned running with the bulls. I, I mean, heard that this morning. Someone invited me to go to Pample in Spain to go run with some bulls maybe this year or next year. So I was looking for the opportunity to uh, do something fun and crazy, and I wasn't sure what it was going to be, but, you know, sometimes you take advantage of your opportunities. And I do have a passport. Please do not leave the GoPro behind. Uh, <laughs> we'll ensure that you, we'll get it nice and strapped uh, uh, in. Uh, yeah, I need one of those little chest things. That's <laughs> little helmet, little helmet with the... Uh, that would be some... Terrifying final footage. I love it. Final <laughs> footage. I'm, I'm, faster, I'm faster than this other guy. I'll be good. Oh, that, that is true. You don't got to outrun the bulls. You just got to outrun the slowest guy there. That's right. That's right. He's bigger than me. So long as he doesn't push me down, I'm good. But beyond that, I'm good. Fair enough. <laughs> all right. For, uh, for all them folks out there, you know, the new year just passed. So maybe they're toning down the troublemaking. But for a plenty few, I'm sure we'll continue. For, any, for anyone that finds themselves in some legal trouble, where can they find you at? How can they get in touch? Sure, reach us out down. at Winslow Law. Right, we got great attorneys, great locations here to serve you wherever you might need. So call us 843-357-9301, WinslowLawyers.com. Got some great things coming up this year. Look forward to talking to you and seeing you. And uh, if you ever need me on my cell phone, 843-655-7333. We're always here for you, day or night, baby. Thanks so much for coming on, Tom. Thank you for having me, sir. I appreciate it. Hopefully so we'll, next time. Maybe we'll see you again. I don't know. So next time. We'll see if this one puts him to sleep. We'll see what plays.